Hello and welcome to Mariology Without Apology. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli. I am very happy to have with us today Dr. Brian Reynolds. He is an internationally renowned scholar, both in terms of uh, Italian literature and Dante, but also Mariology. He has produced really a, a formidable work with a Gateway to Heaven, in which he traces some of the principal Mariological themes of both patristic and medieval period. And uh, in particular, he has as a subject heading, which I want to delve into with him today, uh, Mary Corridentric's uh, remote cooperation in patristic and medieval West. And also he will deal with um, Our Lady's intercession and mediation, uh, which is obviously uh, extremely relevant and poignant to the discussion uh, of Our Lady's role as a spiritual mother of all peoples founded on uh, her participation, her unique participation in the redemption with Jesus, her co-redemptive role, uh, as well as her subsequent mediation. So, uh, Dr. Reynolds, Brian, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, thanks for joining us. It's great to be here. Wonderful. So, uh, seeking to do a little bit of the impossible by covering, you know, centuries upon centuries in an hour. Uh, let's start with the, the idea of Our Lady as co-redemptrix uh, remotely in the first three or four centuries. Uh, can you speak of what you consider to be kind of the, the foundation of that and, 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 and how that's traced uh, within these first three or four centuries? Okay, I'll, I'll try try my best. Um, <laughs> Very good. So, I I think well, to, as I in the book, I, I divide the, the chapters into remote corridentrix and immediate corridentrix, which is a, a rather old fashioned, some people would say, category in uh, Mariology. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially, what it's saying is, if you're talking about remote, it, it is about beginning with, with Mary's um, yes, or even with her uh, eternal plan in the Father as, uh, so really she, she's there from the beginning of, of time as we all are mm -hmm. um, in, in, uh, in the Father and then comes into being. Um, so if you, strictly speak, speaking one to trace it back you can bring it right back to 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 her her own uh, conception and birth um since that's uh where, where the plan of salvation is is um set into motion mm -hmm. um but of course it's more specifically to do with um her yes to god when the angel appears to to her so um, in terms of scriptural passages, perhaps the most important one, of course, would be would be Luke, who um, who tells us of of what happened. Um, and then, following on from Luke, we we um, could go perhaps to Irenaeus. So, just to pause for a moment on uh, on on Luke. Um, there, um, I'm sure you you're aware of the recent uh, studies, wonderful studies that have come out on on Mary's Mary or her her Old Testament roots, her Jewish roots, uh, and, and how Luke um, in Mary's queenship, for example, uh, it's already evident that that he's referring back to to the the matriarchs of the Old Testament and that Mary is. The, uh, the mother of the king. Um, so, you know, or in the, the, the words of the Magnificat, uh, they're absolutely um, impregnated with, with, the, the, um, with the Old Testament. So what one sees in Mary, that, that she is um, a woman of scripture. Uh, she's entirely filled with the word of God before the word of God comes into her physically even. Um, so then moving on to Irenaeus, I think um, the, the major significance of Irenaeus is he's the first person who, who specifically um, makes the link, well, apart from, from Justin Martyr just before him, 
who makes the link between Mary and Eve in, in a very clear way. Um, now that was in the tradition before that, uh, as we were saying before this conversation started in the Apostolic Fathers and so on. Um, but he, he is the one who brings it out. Um, so what he does is he, he contrasts in various ways uh, Mary to Eve. So Mary is um, the one who says yes to God. Eve is the one who has said no, who has turned her back on God. Um, and where the serpent spoke, in, spoke to Mary or to Eve, the angel speaks to Mary and so on. Um, in, so the, the key question here is Mary's fiat, to use the Latin term in, in, uh, in Luke, her, her yes, let it be done unto me according to thy word. And even that uh, use of, of word is interesting because, of course, it's the word of God. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what happens in that moment, Irenaeus understands, is that she, but through her yes, in cooperation with God, she sets about a revolution um, that goes in all directions because it, it's the moment between eternity and time meet. Um, so this moment of the incarnation of Christ reverberates throughout time and space. It goes all the way back to the beginning and it goes all, all the way forward um, to, to the eschaton. And, and this is why Mary, even in the Mariology that, uh, of, of these days, the post conciliar Mariology, it's connected both with Christology and eschatology. Um, and that one can understand already in Irenaeus how the, the, they are also intimately linked because he emphasizes how uh, Mary's importance in the new creation. Um, so the, the restoration or recapitulation, as he calls it, or recirculation, which is not just that um, it's going back to a, a pre-lapsarian uh, perfection, because he sees the, the period in, in Eden before Adam and Eve um, turn away from God, as them being immature, almost like children, but they weren't able to uh, to understand fully uh, what what God's plan was for humanity. Um, and partly, it's an interesting thing. He also talks about how they, they couldn't see God visibly, um, mm -hmm. and and this was important. So, um, actually, here also as an aside, has a sacramental element because, especially Eucharistic, in terms of. Uh, making visible the body of Christ. And of course, in the arc incarnation, in taking on flesh in Mary, God becomes visible to us, the unknown God of the Old Testament. Um, so this was always within the divine plan. That, um, so it's not a, a kind of correcting of a mistake. It's part of uh, what has always been there. And, yep. yep uh, I was saying, I mean, well, there's, there's so many gems you're, you're, you're laying out here uh, that that uh, call for uh, uh, appreciation. But yeah, I, I so much appreciate, you know, kind of the uh, the Catholic predestination concept of Mary, um, and uh, and really, you know, the Scotistic concept that you know there's a certain disorder if you have you know the high point of creation, uh, which is the humanity of Jesus. And the second high point of creation, which is Mary, uh, contingent on lower beings making a mistake. Uh, that, 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 that seems to be, uh, as Scotus would a disorder. Uh, and, and God is the perfect uh, orderer. And so uh, that wouldn't come into play. But, you know, as you're, as you're speaking too, um, and yes, the, the distinctions are more classic of, you know, remote and proximate uh, co redemptrix. But at the same time, how you know when when Irenaeus says you know the cause of salvation for herself and the whole human race, mm. how could you not see that as being involved in the redemption? You know sure. how could that? I mean, granted, we're not at Calvary yet uh, in terms of of the thought, but you know the incarnation is the redemption anticipated and become uh, mm. for the fathers, and so you don't want to exclude. Calvary, and you, so, you certainly don't want to exclude, 
you know, Our, Our Lady as being uniquely cooperating in the work of the Redeemer. Um, I, I incidentally, I find it interesting, you know, there was a, a work by, um, I don't know if you saw the work by two Protestant theologians called Mary for Evangelicals. Yes. Uh, but in, in that work, they say, don't deny the Catholics the title co-redemptrix or mediatrix uh, mm-hmm. in virtue of, just as you're saying, in virtue of the incarnation. Uh, and they wouldn't, to be fair to them, they wouldn't take it to Calvary and, and the full understanding of, of Our Lady's mediation. But, but the idea of isolating her yes from the redemption mm. would be very foreign indeed to, to the fathers of the church, as you're saying. Yeah, as you were talking there, a, a phrase that I read um, recently struck me, that Mary is a perennial yes to God. Yeah, right. um, it, it's not that she says yes once and for all uh, at the appearance of the angel. Her whole life is a yes. Um, and, and, you know, th- there's no discontinuity. It's a growth in yes, because Mary grows just as we all grow. You know, it, you can think of it in terms of our, of our own encounters with God. We encounter God, first of all, in baptism, then in uh, confirmation and so on. I remember I was quite young when I did my confirmation. I was 10. And I, I had a very strong feeling for about lasted for a number of months afterwards Nobody told me to, but I started going to mass every day. Um, Beautiful, you know. And it was it was just something that that um, it, it was a growth. Sure. And, you know. Then at a certain point point in my teenage years, I had to make a, a slightly more adult um, choice. Uh, but I, I never realized what the, some of the consequences of that would be in terms of what my yes meant. So for example, just to give you again, a personal thing, one of the things I find teaching here in Taiwan is if you go too much into the abstract, you lose people. So they're always looking for concrete examples. And a few years ago, my my wife got breast cancer from which she's happily recovered. But that that was a moment where um, I had to renew my yes to God uh, in incomprehension and in fear and so on, but I have to say it. Um, So we can see Mary's yes in in this context, both as her growing and perennial and greater yes, right up to the cross and indeed beyond the cross. Um, And and then we can also see it in in terms of our response to her yes, because we're her children. So we we follow her uh, in, in saying this yes to God, so that, that was one of the thoughts that occurred to me just listening to you there. Yes, and, and, and I should have mentioned that uh, Dr. Reynolds is a professor in uh, Fujian University in Taipei. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, he, he is speaking from a very practical and ongoing experience. Yeah, I, the idea of fragmentation, I think, is, is very foreign to Christian life, as you were sharing. And thank you for sharing that about your own you know, uh, series of, of fiats that you were called to make. It's not like, uh, you know, and, and theologians can or philosophers can have a tendency to do that, right? We, we like categories, but mm. reality, you know, transcends categories oftentimes. And so Mary's yes at the Annunciation, while she's not at Calvary yet, obviously, historically and geographically, it's not to say that her yes wasn't a lifetime yes. Uh, mm. like, a, like a marriage is a lifetime yes, right? Um mm. You don't know what's coming, but you've said yes for the whole time. Priesthood, religious life, it's a lifetime yes. Uh, you don't expect uh, the bishop to uh, call you in at 25 years after priesthood and said, are you still interested in doing this? That's already been sat- satisfied. So the yep. yes of the mother is a lifetime yes. And that's why I appreciated in your in your books, why you don't hesitate to use the term co-redemptrix with the proper distinctions. You know, we don't have to... Um, artificially uh, uh, put into the minds of the fathers things that are not yet developed. At the mm. same time, we don't want to be reductionist uh, about the fact that, you know, well, Our Lady was only saying yes for the first half of the public ministry. Mm. I, I think that would be absurd. Uh, mm. And so uh, there is a beauty in in how the early fathers are focusing on the incarnation. But mm. once again, that expression and the incarnate, you know, the incarnation is the redemption anticipated and begun. And that's why it's very appropriate to say that the doctrine was there from the beginning. 
greater understanding, absolutely greater clarity of what it meant, uh, as we'll see, you know, in, in, in the medievals. But but to deny her unique participation, her unique cooperation in the redemption, I think is 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 to to you know enter a type of uh, primitivism that that I don't think is is merited by the texts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think even from you were talking about the uh, evangelicals, um, you know, it, it is very important to to be sensitive to language and to root these things in in scripture, first of all. Um, but I think it's there in, in scripture, you know, already, as I said, if you if you look at Luke uh, carefully, you, you can see that. Um, and the other thing that, that I wanted to point out about Irenaeus is um, when he makes the, the, the contrast between Eve and Mary, it's very important to, to understand that Eve was free of sin, um, mm -hmm. that, that she had original justice. So she, she was in no way, um, technically speaking, stained by the foams of original sin. Uh, so in other words, she had no tendency. I use the example of uh, uh, what you were saying earlier, how we're both technically challenged by computers. <laughs> you know, when they do forensic examinations to find out what people have been up to, they can still find the traces of things even though you've deleted them. And that's a bit like the foams of, of our ancestors' sins of Adam and Eve's sin remains in us as a mark. Um, but Eve did not have that. So when she... Turned, turned away from God, she freely turned away from God. She freely chose to listen to the voice which said, I want to be like God. Um, and equally so, Mary, because precisely because she was like Eve, although in a different way, um, freed from sin, she her choice was utterly free. She she could we, we think of this in terms of of her freedom in terms of, of choosing to say yes, but she could equally well have said no. Yeah. And sometimes I think, you know, how many Marys were there before Mary or could there have been before Mary? Eve herself was Mary before Mary. Yeah, yeah, um, right. Now, I, I, I'm so glad you bring that up, Brian, because there's, you know, there's there's certain even Marological traditions or, or, or traditions might be a bit strong, but, but, but lineages, that essentially deny it. Uh, they may abstractly say that um, Mary had free will in a certain sense, but she had no choice but to say yes. And I, I and I, I think well to say she had no choice but to say presuppose she doesn't have the freedom, right? Um, and and in a certain sense, I think we have to be careful of a of a theological mechanism, or even a um, a kind of Catholic Calvinism. Which places look if if she says no, then the whole plan is messed up, and 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 therefore, and, and God is unchangeable, and, and so we have these 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 axioms mm -hmm. that we want to satisfy, but the axioms are means to an end, and the end mm -hmm. is the mother and her meritorious free yes, and so if the axiom violates that, it's the axiom that has to be adjusted, not the freedom of the mother. And, and, I, and I'm glad that you bring that forward because, uh, you know, no freedom, no merit, uh, and, and no exemplar for us, you know, which is a, an important theme that comes post conciliar as well. You know, she, she's a model for the church. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm glad that you emphasize that. And, and I want to ask you, if I can, mm -hmm. that, that famous expression of Irenaeus, cause of salvation for herself and the whole human race. Now, mm. why would Irenaeus, I mean, there's two ways we can go with that for the for the, for yourself element. Does Irenaeus not know that Mary's part of the human race? Well, we don't want to go there. Uh, he, mm -hmm. he he gets that. Why does he specify? And once again, without trying to cram what's not in the mind of Irenaeus into his mind, it seems particular that he would specify that he would individualize Mary in light of this plan of salvation. Your thoughts on that? Yes, it's a, it's an interesting question. Um, I mean, there there are two ways that immediately occur to me that one one could um, think of it going right on to to Scotus and to the question of 
um, Mary's freedom from sin. Uh, that that I think for me, it, it, I, I, this is something I've been dealing with recently in Dante. As you said, I also work in, in Dante. And there, there's a beautiful um, section of the paradise in which he, it's the paradise of Mars. And um, Mars represents the whole Roman or classical world and its sort of cyclical view of history. Uh, mm -hmm being unable to escape from that cycle of war and violence and um, so on. And in this he heaven, he, he encounters his ancestor, Caccia Guida. Um, and also there, there's a symbol of a, a luminous cross, mm. which is made up of the souls of the blessed, many different souls. So it's, it's actually part of the, the, the mystical body, the triumphant church, if you like. And um, in this particular passage or particular set of, of Canty in Paradise, he's very struggling with the idea of, of providence, of predestination, of all that sort of, of, of thing, mm -hmm. and how to accept you know, the fact that things are, even in his own life, that he's been exiled from Florence and so on, uh, and in history, and perhaps very relevant today when we're looking at all the, the, the wars and, that are going on and so on one can really question, well, why is it or how is it that God can be providentially present, present in these things? And of course, um, first thing he, 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 he has to accept Dante, this is, is you can never fully penetrate into God's providential plan. Nobody can. can. And he says, not even Mary or the highest angel. Hmm. So, um, there, there is a mystery. It is a mystery to some extent. So what one cannot pretend it, that that's precisely the, the sin of Satan to think that he can understand God's purpose. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is that, that um, our, our notion of time, there's sacred time and there, there's uh, historical time. So, you know, it's like the way one can read one can read scripture as the fathers do in, in which they, they understand scripture as leading beyond itself into eternity mm -hmm. so that um, we, 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 we can view Mary's role or any of our roles from two points of view. One is from our point of view in history uh, and the other is a point of view of God who is in eternity. Mm -hmm. So Mary's, there's no question to me of a contradiction between Mary um, had to say yes and Mary freely chose to say yes, because one is looking at it from the point of view of God's providential view of history, which is, is an eternal present, if you like. Mm -hmm. Whereas Mar Mary's historical point of view, like our own, is she, to, to put it very colloquially, she was a, a young girl. She hadn't got a clue what she was doing mm -hmm. when she said yes in some, some ways. The point is she was willing. She, it was an act of faith. And this is another thing that Irenaeus is very strong on um, is and, and some of the er, other earlier fathers. As Christ was obedient to the Father, so Mary was obedient to 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 God. And obedience is a fundamental category in in some of the early uh, mm -hmm. fathers. That's the contrast that they make between Mary and Eve. It's obedience. Um, the other one being virginity, but that that's a separate subject. Mm -hmm. um, later on in the Middle Ages that obedience in the Eastern tradition becomes from uh, more or less from St. Bede onwards, but Bede, Bede seems to be a, a, a very important figure in bringing together the Augustinian a notion of humility mm -hmm. with, um, with Mary. Uh, and then it passes on in the monastic tradition in, in, in the West. Uh, and you find it wonderfully in, in Bonaventure, in, in uh, Bernard and so on, Mary's humility the extent that Bernard actually says that it is Mary's humility that attracts um, God to her rather than Mary's virginity, which mm -hmm. was the traditional trope. Yeah, beautiful. So let's, so that, that new Eve, I mean, it, 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 <clears throat> it's rather remarkable that most every later dogma and doctrine regarding the mother is found in that new Eve. I mean, uh, clearly here, spiritual maternity is there. She becomes the spiritual mother of all peoples. Um, 
uh, even again, uh, Ruth's mother of God, the Immaculate Conception, her, her, her virginity, um, even uh, the disposition or the foundation for her assumption. It, it, I mean, the new Eve is, is extraordinary in terms mm -hmm. of being a, a mirological compendium uh, of all, and it's and it's that first image. I mean, again, as we talked to before the program, you know, Irenaeus is teaching this in 185. Uh, it's already being taught on three continents, and uh, many hold, and I think there's it's a tenable position that this is part of apostolic tradition. That you got John to Polycarp to Irenaeus. Uh, how mm -hmm. else would it get to three continents? That they're, they're not they're not emailing this stuff uh, uh, around, um, and and and. Yet it seems to be part of what's being taught uh, in, in a very early stage of proclaiming the gospel. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, and it continues on. I mean, it's also, I, I, a few years ago, I published uh, what I did, did a, a chapter for the Oxford uh, Handbook on the Virgin Mary on um, Marian typology in uh, the, the, the Fathers. And, you know, the, the, the the whole a lot the, the importance of typology, which was completely thrown out, if you like, with, with the Reformation, even in the Catholic tradition, it become, became a lot less popular, but which one still finds in things like the, the litany of Loreto. Um, or in, in the um, the Mass, when, when the Dewfall before the consecration, the, the reference to the Dewfall is a typical and very beautiful. A typological image of, of the descent of God's grace or of the Holy Spirit or the incarnation, the dew on, on the fleece of um, the sheep, which was laid out in, in the desert, which is uh, read as a type of the incarnation. So, you know, the Eve Mary typology is the foundation for the extraordinary, beautiful uh, encomia that that are very much the tradition to this day of the Eastern churches yeah. um, who tend to emphasize less the whole kind of dogmatic or doctrinal aspects and, and more of the, the encomiastic. Um, so yeah, it's absolutely fundamental. And then come, you know, towards the end of some say the last of the, 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 the patristic period is Anselm um, of Canterbury and you know, his extraordinary prayer to the Virgin, uh, in, in which he talks of her, uh, you know, being the mother of the new creation and so on, it, that's all coming out of Irenaeus. It's the further development of Irenaeus. Yeah, yeah. It is, um, it is, it is remarkable that, there we are, sorry, excuse me. Something came across my screen, of which it always brings me to a phobic, panic but anyway uh yeah and 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 going from Irenaeus to uh, to Augustine and you know the development there Ambrose and Augustine and of course we've got Saint Ephraim in the east but mm. this, this understanding now of uh mother of the mystical body you know which which becomes so uh key for the western concept you know, Brian, you're, you're you're rightly you know making reference to the Easterns. I mean, we would say by the head or or by the heart, their love mm -hmm. of the mother not only equals us, but perhaps it, it excels. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you can't have a an Eastern church without an icon of the mother. When the preacher mm -hmm. preaches and he makes reference to the to the Theotokos, he he looks over these beautiful references mm -hmm. of, as you say, not so much dogmatic. But experiential uh, and, and and relational love of the mother is extraordinary. The, the Akathist mm -hmm. hymn, mm -hmm. uh, so extraordinary. But but uh, maybe I, I could uh, have you comment just a little bit on on Augustine and and this whole breakthrough about um, you know being the mother of the members united to Christ. Yes, um, I, I think that this is something an essential balance because. Um, uh, some of the very legitimate criticisms that uh, have arisen over the years of, of um, Mary being almost uh, superseding Christ or being made into some sort of a goddess and so on. It's an interesting thing here in, in Taiwan that if you ask ordinary people, 
the difference between Catholic and, and Protestant, they will say, oh, well, you worship Mary. Um, th these are just ordinary people. Mm -hmm. So it, it is something that has to be balanced out and it's not just for um, the sake of people having a misunderstanding, but it's, it's the beauty of Mary is that she is the type of the church. And here we, you know, we, we can come right forward to, to people like von Balthasar and so on. Um, but the, the, um, the, this is the genius of, of Ambrose and Augustine, uh, that they managed to, to, to connect Mary, that Mary as type of the church. One could almost say that, that um, in Mary, just as in the mystical body, and I like to use this, you know, the mystical body and the Eucharist, if you look at the, the comparison or the, the parallel between the two, because of course the mystical body originally started, uh, the notion of the mystical body was actually the Eucharistic, specific Eucharistic, and you're looking at, uh, at uh, Paul and so on. It, it was only um, towards the, 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 the Middle Ages that you begin to get this uh, answer of the mystical body from the question of the relationship between the the um, the rays and sacramentum, if you like, and it go it moves on to be more uh, about the church. Um, so, looking at if you understand the Eucharist, that in each fragment of the Eucharist, Christ is fully present. So, in each. Um, or, or even from a, a Johannine uh, point of view, the, the, the Trinitarian relationships, the indwelling that the Father is fully in the Son and the Son is fully in the Father and so on. Um, so in each Christian, if you like, is, is the fullness of the mystical body. Hmm. Um, we, are each we are each as members of the, Christian, the, the mystical body, we, we, we also should contain each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, um, you know, how do we do this? Well, we do this through the law of love, um, by, by emptying ourselves, by opening ourselves to each other through the communion, which includes the saints and so on. Um, but Mary is, is the type of that. So in her is contained the entire mystical body. Um, but also in each one of us, but of course in her in a way that, that it happens in no other. And, and Augustine somehow seems to intuit this. Uh, and it's a tradition which, uh, you know, it, it is crucially important and very much emphasized in the post-conciliar time that one, you know, Lumen Gentium made. One does not, uh, it, it, one, one understands the church with, with Mary, um, and you, you, one cannot separate them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's, you know, very well articulated. And, and uh, again, it's nice to hear that Eucharistic foundation for the mystical body. And, and you know, when, when Augustine in De Virginitate talks about um, being mother of Christ and all those united to Christ mystically as members, and, and then you have, you know, of course, the much later popes articulating this in, in their encyclicals, um, you know, e even talking about with, with Pope St. Pius X, talking about how, uh, you know, we all come forward from the womb of Mary uh, mm -hmm. in, in a mystical sense. Uh, Augustine, as, as he is in so many other ways, uh, so extraordinarily anticipates this understanding of, 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 a, of a universal spiritual motherhood because mm -hmm. of her role. And, you know, obviously Augustine doesn't come out, uh, you know, strongly on the Immaculate Conception, but he, he, he does s speak about how, you know, about Mary, you know, he, he won't discuss the issue of sin, you know, just mm -hmm. kind of uh, a negative reinforcement of saying, well, we're not going to go there because I don't mm -hmm. know. And there's a reverence, you know, there's this beautiful reverence. And I, you know, I couldn't help but thinking, a few years back, uh, National Geographic had called and, and they were doing a special on, on Mary and, uh, and they did both a, you know, they did a, a good article, but also a, a documentary. But one of the uh, producers called and said, you know, we don't know exactly where to go with Mary in, because there's so little in scripture. And I, so I, I said, I found that a fascinating position for National Geographic 
uh, that you're kind of basically taking a Protestant idea with all due respect, of course, but, but identifying the difference instead of what you guys do. You guys look at art and architecture and culture and poetry and expressions of, of culture in all these dimensions, but you're just limiting your view to Mary to what is in the written text of, 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 of course, of sacred scripture. But, um, and it, it just made me think too, I mean, Augustine and, and, and Irenaeus, and then we'll, we'll have you know, Ephraim talking about the mediatrix in such mm -hmm. profound ways. And yet, it seems like for some Catholics even today, that's too much. It, that's going over the top. But, but the Holy Spirit, in the development of doctrine, he can't regress. He can't go no. backward as if he makes a mistake. Now, in the history of the church, things certain certain Marian truths can can stall. We could say they they could they could have a status quo, but you can't go backwards uh, as if the spirit ha has to uh, kind of confess to uh, to a Marian exaggeration about his human spouse. So th this whole development of doctrine. That's why I find the fathers so absolutely critical. I mean, to state the obvious for our post-conciliar Mariology, because they're mm -hmm. saying things that, that some are hesitant to say now, after the council, even though it's not because of the council, but, but just this whole dimension of, of the development of doctrine, of things that Augustine and Irenaeus are saying, and, and then you get the, you know, the, the Easterns, you know, Cyril of Alexandria, uh, you know, his, his famous hymn, the, the Akathist hymn, Mm. These guys are not, I mean, you could tell why Newman would say to Pussy, look, you have a problem with co-redemptrix uh, when you accept all the things the fathers say about her. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just, just kind of um, an extraordinary realization of what they were saying so much so early about the mother mm -hmm. in these areas. Yeah. Okay. I, I, yeah, I just want to go back for a moment to origin on um, in connection with the mystical body, because it's always struck me what Origen says about um, when when uh, Jesus uh, entrusts um, Mary to the Son mm -hmm. um, or to 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 John, that that he is very strong on on the idea that that, that John must be Christ. Um, and it, this I would connect very much with the mystical body that 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 this is the moment when Mary becomes uh, the mother of the church, as it were, um, and the mother of humanity. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's um, but but it is necessary for us to be Christ in order for her to be uh, our mother. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it, and of course she too has to be Christ. So it's it's you know ultimately it is all Christological. It's mm -hmm. all about the, the the body of Christ, and the same when one comes to the the famous statement of Augustine about Mary being a member of the Church, and you know the Church is greater than than Mary. Mm -hmm. um, if one sees it in terms of what the mystical body is, that that each member of the mystical body is fully Christ, and mm -hmm. yet like the um, the, the, the flowers of a petal, each one has its own beauty um, and its perfection in itself, yet the whole um, flower is a greater reflection of that. Um, and in thinking of this image, I'm thinking of two things. One is, is the beautiful image of Dante, who, who uh, sees uh, the heaven as being uh, an enormous white rose in which, you know, each saint is seated on a petal of the rose mm -hmm. and mary is in the highest place in in the east uh as the sun rises over her um as the most splendid petal but in a certain the, the rose itself is generated from her womb um mm. and of course the rose is jesus so the, it's an all an interlocking relationship um in that way yeah, that, that's that's uh, well said. I, I couldn't help but think of, you know, fast forwarding uh, greatly to the discussion during the Second Vatican Council uh, regarding whether the church should give Our Lady the title Mother of the Church or just Daughter of the Church. And there were many, you know, uh, a longtime friend, Father Laurentan, 
-hmm. who was vehemently opposed to calling Mary mother of the church because he feared that that would be putting Mary above the church. Mm -hmm. But um, but that's that's to misunderstand that you know our, our lady at once mysteriously is mother and member. Uh, yeah. I mean, without the yes, we don't get Jesus, and therefore we don't get the church. Uh, mm. With her yes, uh, we get both. And so mm. she she anticipates the church. Uh, uh, you know, Ambrose uses this the expression that, um, of course, uh, you know, uh, Mary is a type of the church. You could almost say that the church is a type of Mary as well, in the sense that if if biblical typology means if David is a type of Christ, mm -hmm. which means um, his greatness is anticipating one yet greater, uh, you'd have to say that, you know, in a certain sense, we as church are uh, seeking to become more like the mother. Uh, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll never fully achieve that. But uh, so so it's it's a it, it is profound mystery, but. Uh, Lord Tun, you know, mentioned at a Miralogical Congress. Yes, of course, after Paul VI declared it, I accepted Mother of the Church. But mm. uh, so it, it's uh, these things are quintessentially relevant to Mariology mm. today. The, these elements that we're getting from the fathers and 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 what Augustine is saying, um, and again the New Eve, and then even you know, um, I, I want to go to Ephraim uh, as well. Uh, but I think you had a disposition for for a comment on, on Proclus as well before we move on. Yeah, well, we'll just be going back on something you, you just say, said now, you know, in talking in terms of typology, um, if you see it in terms of the mystical body, um, it's the, the, the type of the Old Testament is fulfilled in the new. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's a mutual relationship that the type, the, the Old Testament uh, type anticipates uh, what, what is going to come, but also what, what, what comes afterwards fulfills. Um, and the, the two are necessary for each other. So, so the, the church in some sense, uh, you could almost say it's necessary for, it, for Mary, it completes Mary. It is the completion of Mary. Um, but without Mary, there cannot be 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 a church. Um, so you know, there th th there's that interlocking thing, as I say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So uh, in in a sense, you could say that Mary, um, that that in Mary, we we see what we need to become, um, but. She also sees us as what, uh, as what we can become. Our potentiality is in. Um, we look to her towards something that we admire, but she she also sees in us our potential to be church. So, um, just in terms of Proclus, I, I just wanted to mention one thing which I think is is important because it's not that common in the fathers, but it is there. The, the, the notion of the presence of the whole Trinity, uh, because Proclus talks of, of Mary in this beautiful, um, he, he uses the image, imagery of weaving and woof and so on, which is a typical Syrian. Proclus was of, of uh, Syrian origin, and it, it, it's there in Ephraim as well. The, 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 um, you, you can see all this, again, coming, I keep on coming back to, to, to living in Taiwan, but living in the East, one of the things that I, I emphasize is that Christianity is not European. Christianity is yeah. Asian. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's very important in terms of enculturation in this part, these parts of the world to realize that. Um, so people like Ephraim and Proclus are extremely important to understand that Semitic uh, Middle Eastern origin. So Proclus um, talks of Mary's Mary as the workshop of the Holy Spirit. Um, and, and she, she has this image of Mary weaving the body, or he, Mary is weaving the body of, of, of Christ in her womb. Uh, and and the, you know, the, there are the three persons there present in this process of weaving, uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, and 
this, of course, brings us back to, to, to Luke again, because in the Annunciation scene, we have the three persons of the Trinity um, already present there. It's the first manifestation of God uh, in, in his, uh, from, you know, in, in this form of the Trinity uh, in, in the New Testament, um, not chronologically because Luke was written after Paul, but it's, it's um, you know, at the, at the Annunciation, God shows himself as Trinity. Mm -hmm. um, and just a little curiosity before you, 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 you make a comment. You, somebody told me this once and I checked it out. It's true that in every language from Russian in the East to Gaelic, my native tongue in the West, the word for Trinity is feminine. Fascinating. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, there, there could be all types of Colby and uh, spinoffs on that, Brian, because, of course, you know, uh, if 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 the Holy Spirit in particular is the feminine uh, dimension of the Trinity, then the the co-naturality, if we go Thomistic, of the mm -hmm. fact that the spirit uh, acts only through the immaculate one, not through necessity, but disposition, which is a nice theological way of saying uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't have to, he just wants to, and he mm. does, you know, mm. acting through the mother. So you've got that that wonderful feminine dimension, even with the Hebrew ruah, which of course mm -hmm. is also feminine. Mm. Uh, the, the spirit yeah. is feminine. Yeah. So, well, let's go to, uh, as time is ticking here, yes. uh, and you continue to offer invaluable gems in your commentary, uh, let's go to Ephraim, and we're talking East and Asian you know, there was uh, often quoted this expression of Ephraim, you know, about Jesus, you know, cum mediator, mediatrix todius mundi, you know, uh, you know, with the mediator, you marry the mediatrix of the entire world. Mm. Uh, and, and some would make a, um, a legitimate distinction between co-redemption and mediation, and, and mm. that's legitimate in a sense. At the same time, if you're emphasizing motherhood, uh, it's the same mother who suffers for a child that also uh, nourishes the child, as well mm -hmm. as intercedes for the child. So once again, the distinctions are important, but we have to return to the fact we're talking about a mother, and it's a universal mother who suffers, but also nourishes. She also, even if we're going to jump ahead to, to Bernard, uh, which we'll have to uh, save for another program, God willing, um, it's not just intercession, it's, it's literally, you know, a, a mesitis, a, a, a go-between, a, a means by which, uh, you know, these, these things uh, are, uh, are united in a profound way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, words on, your, your thoughts on Ephraim? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very delicate question how how one balances this and sees this because one on the one hand one must not take away from christ um as the one mediator um one must also not forget that that christ in his humanity uh is mediating in his person between his uh divine and human natures is uh mediating one must also not take away from the holy spirit mm -hmm. um, um so there's the whole question of soteriology which we haven't really gone into and the relationship between mary and the spirit which you just mentioned there mm -hmm. um so um for me just to put it in a way that that's non-technical or, or or easy to to understand um well, Bernard does this. He he says, well, look, um, you know, uh, we, we can just go to Christ. Of course we can. But he's a bit scary maybe for you or a bit distant or whatever. So, well, you know, fine, go to Mary. Um, what, what, what I would tend to say is this, that my personal preference is that, that Mary always directs us to her son. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, again, I go, go back to a personal experience. 
when I was in the chapel in my university one day, I, there's a statue of Mary in the corner and then there's the tabernacle with the cross over it. And I was asking Mary for something. And I, I kind of got this very distinct feeling that Mary was saying, Oi, go, 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 go talk to my son, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and that, that's what she does. Mary, she, she brings us to Christ. Mm -hmm. And if you see mediation in those terms, rather than seeing her as taking away from Christ mediation, yeah. um, that, that's what I would kind of root everything in. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, I think that's it's very well put. And um, uh, I appreciate your Taiwanese practicality with this because uh, it's incarnational, right? Uh, to, to not circle around the term, but uh, it's all about uh, us living the faith today in, in practical mm. ways. And, mm. you know, there was a, there was a book written, it was actually under a pseudonym uh, by a father, uh, Father Morrissey, it was called For the Love of Mary. Uh, I think mm, a yes. bit of an Irish twist on there, but, uh, but he was talking about the philosophical errors regarding the misunderstandings of, of, of Mary. And I think he well articulated what he called the compartmentalization theory. And that is, uh, simply put, it's a two-room theory. You know, you're in the hallway. Mm. There's the Jesus room on this side. There's the Mary room mm. on the other side. You've got to choose. Mm. Well, that's a false dichotomy. Mm -hmm. um, they're in the same room. And mm -hmm. if you're uh, if you're uh, Mexican, if you're an Aztec uh, individual mm -hmm. in, the, in the 16th century, it'll probably be Our Lady of Guadalupe that brings you to Jesus. Because uh, mm -hmm. as the Minister of Education from Mexico said to me, we'll do anything Our Lady of Guadalupe tells us. If she says, my son's divine, we're okay with that. Okay, <laughs> uh, Or it could be, as your experience, you know, or, that Jesus from Calvary says, you know, behold your mother. The point yeah. is, they're in the same room, and they're both, mm. her mediation is only a subordinate participation in his mediation for the sake of greater union with him through a mother's heart. So, you know, it, it's almost like uh, being careful not to bring a dysfunctional relationship to the people of God mm. or the mystical body, as if, you know, as if the son and the mother are in competition or we choose mm. either one. I mean, imagine going over back to the practical, imagine a friend uh, saying, you know, my mother's coming over, you know, I'd love you to meet her. And, you, and your response is, you know, I'd really prefer not to. I'm afraid that would enter a competition uh, between you and your mother that I don't think would be healthy. Mm. Well, well, that's what's unhealthy, right? Is a concern that there's going to be a competition. And so, Again, we have to be careful. We have to make our distinctions. But, um, you know, St. John Paul II says, you know, Mary's mediation is really at the service of God the Father. And, he, yes. and it is an interesting expression. He doesn't say at the service of Jesus, which he well could. Yes. I, I think that's, that's an absolutely key point, that, that we forget that Christ is always turned towards the Father. Right, right. Right. And Mary is turned towards Christ. Right. So they, each in their own way, and one subordinate to the other, if you want to use that sort of language, yeah. they, they bring us into the bosom of the Father. They, right. they always bring us there. And if you can reverse the vision for once and, and actually see it from the Father, not from our point of view, right. then... You, you you see a totally different way of of seeing of seeing Mary of seeing Christ. Um, of course, there's there's a huge distinction between them, but exactly as you say, uh, you know that th that Mary under the cross. Where is she looking? She's not looking away. Yeah, right. She's looking at Christ. Right. And as any mother would, their son in agony. They they, they you know she's the and this is one of the things that I, I like to emphasize as well. Mary is not the kind of soft, passive uh, thing that, that feminist Mariology, uh, you know, talks about this patriarchal construct and so on. 
But in reality, if you look at the Mary indeed of, of uh, the East, the patristic East, she's the Molière Fortis, she, she is a strong woman. Yeah. Um, and no, nobody stronger than under the cross because she doesn't take her eye off Christ. And our, you know, uh, as is, uh, we haven't gone on to this, but if you look at the whole uh, question of Marian plaints, which are born in the Eastern church, um, people people like like um, uh, Maximus the Confessor or um, so on. And then moving into the, the West, you have the Marian plaints in, in the wonderful vernacular ones of the uh, of uh, the Italian Valdesi companies and so on, where Mary is is being very dramatic and very unlike the the Ambrosian uh, Stoic Mary. But its purpose is is what it's all to allow us to participate through her in the passion. Um, and that, that's, that's what she does in her mediation too. She helps us to turn towards Christ, who is the one who, who brings us to the Father. It's as simple as that. Yep. Now, I can't imagine a better uh, closing statement, uh, Brian, for that, because uh, uh, it, it's Trinitarian, it's Christocentric, it's Marian, it's ecclesiological, and it's all in one hour. So that's not bad at all. <laughs> so, Listen, I, I, I thank you so much. And um, uh, in, in, a, in a type of Marian utilitarianism, before I let you go, I want you to say on air whether or not you'd be willing to come back again. Uh, so we can do a little bit of, um, of uh, Marian medieval treatment. Uh, because uh, again, we, we haven't even finished the fathers, but uh, this is so rich. And uh, if you'd be open, Love to have you come back and do another program on Our Lady in the Medievals. Absolutely. No That'd be problem. wonderful. Yeah. Well, listen, thank right. you again. Thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, profound insights, both and also for your uh, personal witness, which comes forward, which is the ultimate you know, manifestation of our love for, for the mother, right? I mean, theologians have this danger uh, of getting too abstract and uh, distinctions apart from the fact that uh, she ultimately and perennially and in the last moment is mother, is quintessentially mother. What, what's more practical, incarnational, and, 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 uh, uh, and, and bringing forth fruit uh, than that? So, uh, so I thank you so much, Dr. Reynolds, and uh, grateful for your uh, somewhat pressured willingness to come back again. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. And, You're uh, very welcome. And very much looking forward to it. Thank you. So to all of you for uh, Mariology Without Apology, thanks for being with us. Uh, and let's continue to do all that we can to fulfill Our Lady's great biblical prophecy that all generations will indeed call her blessed. Thank you all and God bless. <laughs>